Well, good day, everybody, and welcome to the NCSL uh, webinar on where money and free speech intersect. My name is Daniel Ivy Soto. I'm a state senator from New Mexico, and uh, I also um, got into the issue of money and free speech and, and in politics in general uh, when I was the state elections director in New Mexico and was also uh, oversaw the uh, ethics department uh, of the Secretary of State's office uh, in addition. The, and of course, there is a lot to talk about on this issue. We have a couple of fantastic guests uh, with us today, which we're going to get to in just a minute. Uh, but before we do that, let me first turn it over to our very capable uh, staff from the National Conference of State Legislatures who uh, will be guiding us through this next hour. And Chris, uh, Christy Samaripa has been taking the lead on this one. And so, Chris, uh, Christy, what does everybody need to know as we move through the webinar today? Well, thank you, Senator. Hello, everyone. My name is Christy Zamaripa. I am a policy associate with the Elections and Redistricting Program here at NCSL. Uh, today's webinar is a platform uh, for information exchange and engagement. Over the next 60 minutes, we encourage participation through our chat box. So feel free to type your questions and any answers to questions uh, there. The chat box is in the lower left-hand portion of your screen. Um, now, to help begin building some comfortability with the chat function, and to also learn who is on the line today, I invite you to type in your name and state. Uh, and so I look forward to seeing everybody that's on the webinar today. Now, for this presentation, you will see a couple of tabs on your screen. Uh, one of those tabs is listed resources. Uh, there, you can find several PDF lists that contain a treasure trove of resources from NCSL, Issue 1, and Institute of Free Speech. Um, I also wanted to mention that today's discussion will have few PowerPoint slides, so don't worry if you don't see your screen change very much today. However, the slides that we do have will be posted, are posted underneath the resources tab. Also, there is a speaker tab that contains the bios of each of today's speakers. Now, this webinar platform is optimized for use in Google Chrome in Google Chrome, excuse me, while other web browsers such as Firefox may work, we recommend that anyone that has experienced any kind of technical difficulties try signing in through Chrome instead. If you continue to experience technical difficulties, please email registration at ncsl.org, and I am putting that in the chat box just in case. Now, lastly, uh, today's webinar is being recorded. A link to access the recording will be posted to the webpage within the week. So that's the end of housekeeping. I am going to turn it back over to uh, Senator Ivy Soto. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Christy. Appreciate that. Uh, our first uh, presenter today, and, and I do want to emphasize uh, what Christy was saying before, uh, we're doing this old school, uh, which is um, uh, primarily having having a conversation and not relying upon upon um, the the visuals uh, as we do so. So uh, uh, please, um, there's nothing wrong with your browser as we as we move move through all of this. Uh, so our our first presenter today uh, to uh, discuss some issues with regard to uh, money and free speech is Danielle Caputo. Uh, Danielle Caputo uh, works with uh, Issue One, uh, which is uh, uh, a, a cross-partisan political reform group in Washington, D.C. that unites Republicans, Democrats, and Independents uh, in their movement to fix uh, the broken political system. And Danielle is the Legislative Affairs and Programs Council 
uh, where she has been since January uh, 2019. Prior to joining uh, Issue 1, Danielle worked on the Senate Judiciary Committee, and as a law student, she interned with the Federal Election Commission uh, with Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington and with Common Cause. She has a BA in Political Science and International Relations from the Florida International University, a Master's of Public Policy from the George Washington University Trachtenberg School of Public Policy, and a JD from the George Washington University uh, Law School. Danielle, take it away. Hi, well, thank you first to the National Conference of State Legislatures and Christy for inviting me to be on the webinar, and thank you to Senator Ivy Soto for moderating it. Um, the First Amendment, and specifically the right to free speech, was and continues to be foundational to the United States. As Justice Cardoza once said, freedom of expression is the matrix, the indispensable condition of nearly every other form of freedom. Speech protected under the First Amendment includes making political contributions. However, when speech takes the form of anonymous political contributions, there's a compelling governmental interest in limiting such speech. That compelling governmental interest is ensuring that elected officials are not being corrupted or that the public does not believe that they are corrupt. This is because corruption causes a greater harm to the marketplace of ideas than transparency, particularly because transparency doesn't prohibit people from using their First Amendment right to spend money in an election. As the saying goes, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Anonymous political spending in elections is harmful to our democratic republic. Transparency provides voters information about what may sway a candidate's policy choices. The founders even wrote the First Amendment to ensure that the public has the information that it needs to engage in a robust political debate. But without knowing who's behind political spending that influences elections and politicians, voters can't make informed decisions which subverts the founders' intent. Unfortunately, the transparency laws have not kept up with technology advancements. On the federal side, neither Congress nor the Federal Election Commission have passed laws or promulgated rules that would extend transparency laws that exist for television, radio, and print to the internet adequately. We're watching in real time the harm that results in that failure to act. We have irrefutable evidence that foreign operatives purchased digital ads to influence elections in 2016. In 2018, Facebook, Google, and Twitter felt compelled to act, developing databases to boost transparency. But their databases have many problems, and it honestly shouldn't be left to private companies to stop foreign adversaries from interfering in our elections. The transparency laws that do exist, unfortunately, also contain multiple loopholes that allow individuals from other countries to set up shell corporations to illegally contribute to super PACs and other political groups. There are bipartisan bills that have been introduced in Congress that could solve some of these issues, um, like the Honest Ads Act or the Shell Company Abuse Act, but they've stalled in negotiations. Unfortunately, the federal government's lack of response to these issues has also negatively impacted the states, but some are doing what they can to increase, increase transparency at the state level. Colorado, New Jersey, Washington, and California, for example, have all passed transparency laws in the past, last few years. Even some localities such as St. Petersburg in Florida and Seattle and Washington State have passed dark money transparency reforms. While there is a legitimate question of constitutionality in some of these specific provisions of these reforms, states and localities acting to increase transparency um, continue to happen and it shouldn't, this shouldn't, should not slow down. Given how important transparency is to the marketplace of ideas and preventing corruption, and the public's belief that corruption runs rampant in the U.S., we need to do more. A recent poll even found that 87% of voters nationwide believe corruption is widespread in the federal government. That also translates into state and local governments, with 70% of people believing that their state government is corrupt and 57% believing that their local government is corrupt. As Justice Scalia said in Doe v. Reed, requiring people to stand up, for, stand up in public for their political acts fosters civic courage, without which democracy is doomed. For my part, I do not look forward to a society which campaigns anonymously, hidden from public scrutiny, and protected from the accountability of criticism. This does not resemble the home of the brave. Individuals can and should be free to use their freedom of speech to make political contributions, but they should not be able to do so anonymously. Great, thank you for uh, so much That is uh, for that opening uh, those opening comments. Uh, we now turn to um, Bradley Smith, 
uh, who is the chairman and founder of the Institute for Free Speech. And he is, uh, Brad is one of the nation's foremost experts on campaign finance law. Uh, he served as vice chairman and as chairman of the uh, Federal Election Commission uh, before resigning uh, as of uh, August of 2005. Uh, he also is the author of the 2001 book, Unfree Speech, The Folly of Campaign Finance Reform. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Professor Smith serves as uh, a professor of law at Capital University Law School uh, and uh, has previously served as a member of the advisory committee for the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Election Law. Uh, and uh, is uh, very uh, involved in a variety of other uh, think tanks and organizations uh, dealing with the issue of uh, the intersection of money and speech. And so, Brad, go ahead with your opening statements. All right. Well, thank you, Senator. And I, I thank uh, Christy and NCSL for having me here for the webinar and all those who are in attendance and Danielle for her comments uh, to, to get us underway here. Um, so I tend to like to offer perspective on these things, and I want to begin by noting, as Danielle noted, that money involves speech. Sometimes people wonder, you know, what is that intersection? You know, speech is speech, money is money. But if you limit money for the purpose of regulating speech, it's problematic. For example, if we, one would not be able to say to the New York Times, you can only spend, say, $50,000 a year to publish, we would all recognize that that would infringe on their ability to publish and their First Amendment rights. And similarly, you can't for example, no matter what your stands are, for example, if, you, if you're if you strongly in favor of gun control in ways that the courts have said, no, you can't do it, you couldn't get around that by just trying to limit the ability of people to spend any money to buy or manufacture a gun. You couldn't get around the protections of Roe v. Wade by simply saying that people can't spend any money to provide facilities for performing abortions or something like that. So money is integrally related to the uh, uh, speech issue. Now, for most of our nation's history, Campaign finance was uh, unregulated, either as a de jure matter or as a de facto matter. Heavy regulation is really a product only of about the last 45 years. Uh, the Federal Election Campaign Act in its present form is, in fact, 45 years old, and most state regulations tend to follow that. So this is really something relatively new in American society. And one thing I always ask is we should begin by asking, do we think our democracy and our democratic processes have been improving over that time period or not? Um, while money is important to elections, it's mainly important because it allows voters to hear arguments. Uh, it is not the automatic winner that some people think. As uh, uh, Jeffrey Milo, uh, the University of Missouri's Truman School of Government notes, he says, quote, there's something of a scholarly consensus standing in stark contrast to popular wisdom so often echoed by pundits, politicians, and reform advocates that elections are essentially for sale to the highest bidder. Decades of social science research consistently reveal a far more limited role for campaign spending. Um, now, again, it's not that that is unimportant. Since Citizens United was decided a decade ago, uh, the system has actually grown more open. Incumbent win rates are down, which may not be pleasing for some members of NCSL to hear. Uh, changes in Congress and the state houses have been actually uh, more common. Uh, the types of candidates who are winning tend to be more uh, variety, more voices are, are being heard, and generally that is a good thing. The complaint, now, therefore, now that we usually tend to hear goes to this question of what is called oftentimes dark money, uh, which is an effort to kind of come up with a phrase that sounds very sinister and, and, and sort of, you know, uh, bad. It's a phrase that lacks any real clear definition, unfortunately, which makes it somewhat uh, malleable. And there have been efforts to, to use fears of dark money to expand disclosure laws. Now, the Supreme Court has long supported disclosure laws for direct campaign contributions to campaigns and for independent expenditures by people, individuals, groups that specifically uh, advocate electoral outcomes, the election or defeat of candidates. But the Supreme Court, in sticking with uh, longstanding precedent on privacy in many areas, has held as well that you can't just regulate anything that might touch on public affairs, that Americans have, an have a right to keep their associations private uh, and to keep their most of their financial donations private and so on. And the battle recently has all been about expanding the traditional regulation into areas where it has not gone before. 
uh, and where the Supreme Court has generally not ruled on it. One of the big uh, arguments given for this in the last couple of years has been alleged foreign interference in the 2016 election. I personally don't doubt at all that the Russians were trying to interfere in the 2016 election. I, I often say what kind of geopolitical rival would they be if they weren't? Of course, they're trying to influence our elections, and they were trying to do it in the 70s and in the 80s using the technologies of those days. In fact, uh, Russian ad spending appears to have been approximately 0.01% of spending, that is not 1%, that's not one-tenth of 1%, that's one one-hundredth of 1% of ad spending in the 2016 election. I doubt that that is something that has really uh, uh, destroyed the integrity of the American election system. So we need to keep fighting foreign interference in elections, but we shouldn't let it be uh, sort of a uh, uh, an outsized boogeyman that we use to pass laws that may not be generally wise. In fact, generally speaking, all, so to speak, dark money has never since Citizens United reached even 5% of total political spending nationwide. Now, obviously, that might vary in one state or another, but the general sense, uh, general, and it might vary in one race or another, but generally, it's a very low percentage. At this point in this cycle, it appears that it's going to come in at somewhere around 2% of the total. Uh, and much of that comes from groups that are well known to voters. When we talk about voters need to know who's trying to influence their vote, I don't think voters are terribly fooled when they see some of the leading, quote, dark money groups, which have to publish that they made expenditures, right? They do publish that they made expenditures. They just don't tell you all the people who gave them money. Those groups include like the United States Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Realtors, uh, the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, and NAACP Action Fund, Planned Parenthood Action Fund, I don't think most Americans look at those names and are just sitting and thinking, I have no idea who's trying to influence my vote. I think they do. So you've got a very small percentage of the total, and much of that comes from groups that are well-known to voters. For those reasons, we should be sure that we don't start letting the tail wag the dog, that we should recognize that there are a number of valid reasons for disclosure, uh, limitations or limitations on disclosure. It tends to suppress small donors who don't necessarily want their names public, who can be subject to harassment. Um, it is uh, disproportionately harms volunteer and small budget organizations when disclosure gets too granular. It's very hard to comply with. It's relatively easy, for example, for a small organization to say, okay, don't take any corporate money. I understand that rule. To file the reports is a very different thing. Attempts to increase disclosure may also create what we call junk disclosure by linking donations to activities unrelated to a donor's intent. For example, under many proposals in state law, a donor might give something to a group, let's say a, a chamber, state chamber of commerce, nearly two years before the following election uh, for purposes totally unrelated to that following election, but under the some of these proposals is then required to disclose that they were donors, quote, behind an ad, and that is simply not true, and it's not fair either to the company that gave money to the chamber, it's really not fair to the chamber, and it's misleading to voters about who is really behind something. So with that, we urge people simply to uh, be careful. Don't jump on anything that comes along. Keep the perspective and problem, and keep in mind the kind of trade-offs that need to be made uh, when we begin looking at, uh, at excessive uh, disclosure laws. Like most areas, we find that zero-tolerance policies tend to be very inefficient by the time you get to that last 1% or 2%, and we should proceed with caution. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let's, let's pick up the conversation uh, there. Um, and and, and 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 let's talk about we're we'll be talking about limits on contributions in just a couple of minutes, but let's let's first talk about disclosure laws. And you know, it is argued that increases in, in disclosure rules uh might lead to the suppression of smaller donations and thereby limiting uh people's right to participation. What consequences uh may there be with stricter uh, disclosure rules and and what's the threshold of disclosure that we should be looking at? And we'll start with uh, with uh, Danielle, and then we'll uh, pivot over to, to Brad on the same question. Sure. So um, I think it's first important to kind of contextualize when we're talking about contributions, just exactly what percentage of the population. So for context, in 2016, only 12% of Americans uh, gave to candidates at all. And among those, only point, or within the entire U.S. population, only 0.52 percent um, of the population donated $200 or more to political candidates. So I think, generally speaking, 
the donor class is really a tiny portion of um, the general public to begin with. And so I, I think it's a little bit misleading to say that it's going to having these having these um, disclosure rules are basically going to disincentivize people from wanting to contribute anyway, because as you see, the people who are contributing are mainly people who are contributing in large sums and um, the general public isn't getting involved to begin with. And I think more helpfully when you're talking about disenfranchising or preventing people from using their speech, uh, that more often comes from people not having the funds to be able to donate to begin with. So I think that that's more of an issue when it comes to people not using money in order to have use that form of their free speech. Um, I also would say that if people are going to be disincentivized to donate money, um, given what they're donating to, that um, going back to Justice Scalia, there needs to be a little bit of civic courage. And if you're not willing to kind of stand for what you believe in, then there's a question to what you're donating and why you're donating. Um, on the flip side, of course, there is for individuals who truly believe that they're donating to something that is good and righteous, you know, um, the NAACP, there was a seminal case involving them. Um, the Socialists of America were also um, involved in issues where they actually genuinely feared for reprisal, whether that was from their employment or from individuals, um, and they had a legitimate feel, fear of bodily harm, then their contributions were able to basically be done more anonymously to protect them. But I think unless you're getting to that level, having an amount of civic courage in making donations should be required. Brad? Yeah, I, I think first that, that we should recognize uh, about 12% of the people contributing to campaigns is probably the single most way in which people formally affiliate with themselves with a campaign. In other words, most people don't get involved in political campaigns at all beyond voting. And so we should be encouraging that, not discouraging it. And in fact, we do find that people have legitimate reasons for being concerned. Now, again, if they're giving to campaigns, by the way, that, that's all disclosed. So that's not really what we're talking about today. What we're really talking about is do we want to extend that to people's memberships in groups like the, the National Rifle Association or the NAACP or the Sierra Club or Handgun Control Inc. or pro-life groups, whatever it might be, right? That's what we're talking about, expanding it to those groups that aren't actually political committees but do some, a minority of their work, uh, as political work. Uh, and people are frightened by that. A recent poll uh, that was conducted by YouGov uh, for the Cato Institute found uh, that uh, about half of Americans were afraid to voice their political views because they were afraid of sort of retaliation. There's online retaliation now, or you know, we see just more and more things of people being you know bullied on the streets, interfered with in restaurants, and so on. People even picketing outside houses. So, what I suggest on on the question of disclosure is first. We need to watch the thresholds dramatically. Uh, we should raise the thresholds both for contributions to campaigns, but certainly if we're going to try to extend, uh, limitate, or disclosure to uh, non-campaign, to, to speech about public affairs, we need to set really high thresholds. Nobody really needs to know about the person who is giving $200 or uh, $1,000 or $5,000, really. I, I don't think there's too many incidents where people are buying state contracts with a $1,000 campaign contribution. Uh, and those, I, I think, when they come up can, in fact, be dealt with through traditional law enforcement means. So I recommend that we push those thresholds up substantially. And we should bear in mind when we talk about Justice Scalia, look, I like Justice Scalia. Uh, his son came out and performed the wedding for my daughter because we were, you know, good friends. Uh, his, his son's a, a priest, you know, and and uh, I admire him tremendously. But look, Justice Scalia had an outgoing, exuberant personality that liked political fighting uh, and verbal conflict. He had lifetime secret service protection, and he had uh, uh, lifetime tenure in his job. Most people don't have those kinds of things. And the First Amendment is not merely there to protect the strongest of us. It's there to protect oftentimes the weakest of us. And if we want those voices to be heard, then we need to give them room. So we need disclosure thresholds that are considerably higher than they exist in most uh, places today for campaign contributions and in most proposals to extend disclosure beyond campaign contributions. And we need to allow 
uh, for we need to cabin off just what needs to be disclosed to make sure we're really getting at stuff that's, if anything, really has that direct influence on elections and not just people talking about public affairs and public policy. So what I'm hearing from you, Brad, is that anybody who gives over a certain threshold, let's say $100,000, should automatically qualify for Secret Service protection. Uh, <laughs> sure, sure. Come back, right? Okay. No. I, um, yeah. In, 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 in all seriousness, though, you know, um, Justin Levitt, uh, one of the things that I, I think he's, he's put forth and some other people have talked about is, is the, 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 the duality of, of the regulation so that we have the information should it ever become relevant versus what does the public really need to know? Right, and and which which kind of gets to to the issue that you were just talking about in terms of the thresholds or the levels, right? And and so and so for Justin, his his solution to that is to create kind of like a nutrition label for for political giving that would be that would that would list the the highest givers to a campaign or people who've given over a certain threshold that would be that would be immediately digestible by the public. Whereas all the other people who've given, they're off in a report someplace, but 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 not quite so immediately digestible. And frankly, it's you know pages and pages of reports aren't digestible anyway. Um, what is your sense of that, uh, Brad? And then we'll turn it back over to Danielle uh, on the same issue on that. Well, I think first, kind of working backwards, you've raised an excellent point that when you include all these small small donors, the reports tend to lose their value to the extent that. Uh, voters are trying to think who's really behind something, you know, who's the motivating, driving special interest behind some candidate. So I do think that's another reason to keep those uh, uh, numbers higher. And it makes a good point then, Justin makes a good point about the enforcement side of things. For example, with tax returns, I mean, we don't, we, we all file our tax returns, but we don't make them public, right? Uh, and certainly if we made them public, I suppose we could catch a few more tax cheats. But we recognize that there is that kind of trade off between uh, privacy and, and how we want people to behave. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't I think that's another uh, factor suggesting that we don't need disclosure of very low donations. But again, to me, the biggest question ultimately comes down to what are we going to require to be disclosed? So if somebody joins a a group, uh, uh, 501c4 social welfare group, you know, big groups like that at the national level would include things, some of them like the National Rifle Association, the CR Club, and, and all those kinds of groups are organized like that, you know, and, and or if they join those groups down at the local level, or if they join a trade association, should they be identified as the speaker whenever those groups make uh, uh, political expenditures. And I'm not sure that they could because they may not even support that particular ad or that particular expenditure. Uh, they just support the organization at large. And so we need to be careful about that. And again, it's not, I want to keep emphasizing, it's not, although I myself have slipped up sometimes in this talk it's, itself, we're not talking about contributions to candidates being disclosed. Those are already disclosed. What we're talking about is, and we're not talking about uh, ads specifically advocating for or against a candidate. Those are already disclosed. What we're talking about is people giving to organizations that tend to run a few ads perhaps about a candidate, but it's not generally what they do, or just to organizations generally, you know, they're, they're, that, that run ads about public affairs and political life. And I think that's an area where we need to be very careful. Danielle? So I think that um, when we're talking about social welfare organizations, 501c4s and trade associations, um, I think I don't necessarily disagree that when we're, when we're focusing on contributions there, people are getting involved in issues that they care about. And as a social welfare organization, the majority of your activity should not actually be endorsing um, candidates or advocating against candidates, but should be focused on the specific issue at hand. The problem is it's not very clear exactly what constitutes, you know, your major purpose being uh, social welfare. And so I think one, an easier way to kind of get at that is first determining for social welfare organizations kind of what what level that is. Um, right now, the general idea is, you know, 49.99% of your activity can be kind of electoral in nature and the rest can be social welfare, but sometimes that goes up higher and the IRS has never really um, kind of moved forward in investigating those C4s. 
Um, I will say when it comes to donors themselves donating to a 501c4, the Sierra Club, for example, um, I, I personally, and as an organization, I don't think that we would advocate that every individual who donates $200 to the Sierra Club should have to have their name um, put out there. But what I will say is there should be some level of nuance. And if you have a big donor um, who's donating $10,000 to the Sierra Club, and then the Sierra Club decides that they want to run ads, they should have to let their highest donors know. Let's say their top 10 donors know, we're going to do this. Do you want us to use your money for this? Because if you do, then it's going to be on maybe a shorter form release saying, this person gave 10000 this person gave 20 whatever, and that money was used. But if you want to maintain your privacy and you're just donating because you want to be part of the social welfare organization part, side of it, then you can contain and remain anonymous um, in those donations. But once you are willing to step into the political realm, then I think the kind of political concerns for corruption and knowing who's influencing, you know, your candidate or your elected official, that should come more into play and your name shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to kind of use the veil of anonymity for that. Okay. Well, so as we're talking about, what the limits are on contributions or what limits on for reporting should be. Um, and, and, and I'm going to go back to you, Brad, first, uh, just because I think your, your answer is going to be a little more provocative and then, and then over to, uh, Danielle. And that is, uh, where would, where would you set the, the limit for, uh, for when it would be reported? Um, and and should there be any limit as to the contribution levels? Sure. Well, I'm glad I can be provocative here, Heather. <laughs> so let me uh, say, you know, where would I set the limits? I, I think, again, as a matter of what the disclosure threshold should be, I would simply make it much higher than it currently is in virtually every state. In some states, it's as little as a dollar or ten dollars. Uh, we don't need to know that. How much higher? You know, I go a lot higher. $5,000, $10,000. Other people wouldn't go that high. Okay, there's plenty of room in there there to negotiate, and that's what politics is all about. I, you know, the concerns people have, the concerns that Danielle has voiced, for example, are not illegitimate or crazy concerns, right? Uh, so we have to balance things off and sometimes reach some compromises, but those thresholds should be much higher. To me, the bigger question is uh, – what gets disclosed? And again, contributions directly to candidates and political parties and PACs are disclosed now, and that's fine. We're, we're, we're fine with that. I do uh, basically favor the current system, which is that's disclosed contributions to PACs, parties, and candidates, uh, and funds that are spent directly to advocate the election or defeat of a candidate. But I think when people just want to start talking about public affairs and public issues, they should be exempt from the system because otherwise there's no sort of end game to the system. It would just keep swallowing up everything because virtually everything people do can be considered uh, to be, you know, in some way having some influence on public affairs and, and, and who does what. And I think we would find that our, our political speech would be impoverished. And again, I point out that at this point, the kind of speech that we're talking about is not a, a very much, uh, a very large percentage of the total, about 2% total more in certain areas, more in certain races, but generally very low. And that the benefits of trying to squeeze that out are just very, very limited and will come with a cost. As to contribution limits, by the way, I mean, that's sort of another issue. Uh, again, the Supreme Court has long upheld limits on contributions. I think they should be considerably higher. Uh, again, I, I think that's something that, that you know, people can, can negotiate. But for the most part, uh, I think that a lot of the concerns we have about dark money and independent spending would actually go away if we had higher limits on contributions to candidates because most contributors who, who want to influence the election – would rather give directly to the candidate's campaign. It's easier, it's more straightforward, uh, and it's more efficient because candidates get the lowest unit rate for their advertising and independent spenders do not get the lowest unit rate for their advertising because candidates can spend every dollar you give them on their campaign, whereas these nonprofits can only spend you know, something under half on the campaign. So I think we could solve some of those problems uh, by, by raising the contribution limits substantially. Any thoughts on, on the topic, Danielle? Uh, I mean, I certainly am in favor of uh, having contribution limits. Um, and I think that 
the main the main concern for me when we're talking about you know even contributions and and having and knowing who is behind these contributions um another thing that i think is important is kind of recognizing that you also have some of the biggest donors to super PACs and whatever, where they do have, um, they are required to disclose, but there's only that one layer of disclosure. And you often see, you know, this isn't just a theoretical thing, but you often actually see um, individuals who will create LLCs where you don't know who's kind of behind them. And then they'll funnel their money through that LLC and then give to a super PAC. And so you do have, um, you know, their own form of anonymity because you don't know it only goes to that one level. Um, and in those instances, you're basically giving people who are kind of like behind the veil, they have now the ability to kind of influence elections and kind of get around our disclosure laws. And so, you know, closing loopholes like that are important. Right. Only if you have a good corporate attorney. Working exactly. With you. Yes. Okay. So, um, so, so moving to, to 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 a couple of questions that have been put in the in the chat box, we've already been covering covering a couple of these issues uh, already. But um, uh, we so uh, one of the questions that was that was posed uh, starts off with a comment that is that uh, Washington's law on nonprofit campaign finance activity requires disclosure only for top donors. And it's created the effect of increasing spending by affiliated PACs instead of the associated nonprofit. Uh, and and um, and then the comment at the end is that it is uh, increased transparency. Now it's it's unclear to me from that that comment in terms of where the where the spending is going versus versus um, where the money was coming into, creating the the transparency on that. But I do think I do think the states are really struggling with trying to figure out, given given the the box that the Supreme Court has has continually um, massaged through origami, uh, how how to do things effectively at the state level without running afoul of uh, of a number of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, decisions on these issues. But 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 let me um, let me. Uh, pass on to to each of you uh, the question about um, Facebook's decision not to air political ads uh, a week before the elections. Um, and uh, Danielle, what are your what are your thoughts on 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 their decision to do this? Uh, they're both a private uh, corporation, and yet they are also, I think, the epitome of the public square at the moment. So I I think it's a little bit of a sad commentary that um, Facebook is kind of on the there on its own determining kind of what to do to best um, advocate for our democratic republic. Uh, I think that that is the job and the role of our government, um, particularly in kind of instances like this where they have asked for help. They say, I have no idea what to do. I don't want to kind of be the person who maybe stands in the doorway of deciding, you know, the election or whatever. But um, with regard to this specific thing, uh, it's nice, I guess. Like, I, I don't, I don't think that it's going to, you know, particularly make a difference. Um, I know that a lot of voters often decide towards the end of the election how they're going to vote, but, um, you know, I think the last week of political ad spending isn't going to be a big thing. And I think particularly on Facebook, um, it's not the ads necessarily that are the the biggest concern as much it is as it is. Um, you know, kind of misinformation being spread out there by like other Facebook users. Yeah, you know, I'll I'll, I'll tell you that as a as a as someone who's a candidate, uh, in addition to a policymaker, uh, it's it, what's frustrating for me is that Facebook is not distinguishing between uh, between ads by campaigns related to that race versus uh, ads by issue organizations. Uh, about a race, um, it seems to me that the that the evil that they're that they're trying to address uh, is 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 one where which is caused more from the from the uh, from the issue organizations more so than than from the candidates themselves. Uh, Brad, 
Yeah, you know, the, I mean, the thing about that kind of thing, remember way back in 1966, the Supreme Court decided a case called Mills versus Alabama, which made it uh, illegal to run editorials, endorsement editorials on Election Day. And the idea was, well, you know, if you ran these things late in the election, there wouldn't be a chance to respond if things and if some of the charges were false or there was another side that should be heard. And in striking down such a ban, uh, one of the things the Supreme Court noted was, well, that, that's not really that much different if you if you now they'll just run it two days before and nobody will be, have a chance to respond because they're not allowed to run you know, responses on Election Day itself. And I think that's kind of the situation that Facebook may find itself in as well. All the all the ads would just move out to the you know eight days out. But Danielle also raises another point, which we really need to keep in mind as, as people go about this, which is, you know, the bigger concern when people say, oh, we don't like this false news or, or this and that, right, is, is much more than the ads on Facebook. It's just people talking, right? And I don't know what to tell you about you know, Americans and the fact that some people seem perhaps too gullible to retweet things or to, to say things online. I mean, I just read things all the time that are just blatantly wrong about campaign finance law, something I really know about. You know, uh, what do you do about that? Do you trust the voters or not? Ultimately, although there's a lot of bad information out there, I tend to pretty much trust the voters to, to basically get it right that the you know all these things kind of work out in the system. And and I think if you you know if you're not willing to trust the voters and their comments on political speech, if you're going to start saying no, only the experts can talk, uh, only Brad Smith can talk about the FEC because he really knows what's going on, uh, then I think you're really kind of abandoning some core democratic uh, uh, principles. So I, I think it's one of those things again where we need a little. Perspective. We need to realize it's always been there. It's always been conspiracy theories and so on. And maybe there's things that we want private platforms like Facebook to do. Maybe there's a few little laws that might be done. But for the most part, what we're dealing with isn't really that different than what we've always had in our country's history. I'd also like to add, I think one thing that is a concern for me when it comes to Facebook and their ads is the fact that they are targeted more often than not and so and now they do have a um you know a way to kind of look at previous ads and stuff but they don't necessarily capture all the ads um and they don't necessarily include all the relevant information on how they were targeted and i think um one of the bigger problems is even before a week you know outside of the election really knowing who is being targeted with ads and what the ads are saying um and who is actually paying for those ads Yeah, well, and and at some point there's so many ads, right? It becomes like, yes, they've got an archive of all the ads, but going through and trying to figure out who did each one is just an overwhelming prospect as well. Um, so, so as we're as we're as we're looking at these issues, I mean, I did think it was interesting, you know, uh, 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 Brad, you 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 were commenting about about uh, the uh, the familiar relationship between your family and the Scalia family and and uh, uh and, and whatnot and 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 I did note uh that in Justice Gorsuch's um confirmation hearing uh unlike Scalia's commentary about political courage um Gorsuch was was concerned about the free speech rights of the of the of the giver the contributor to the um uh, to to an issue, uh, is there anything coming up at this point uh, on the horizon um, towards the Supreme Court that we should be aware of or should be looking at uh, in terms of uh, emerging issues or emerging cases? Uh, I don't think there's any case that I'm looking at that I think is likely to go up to the Supreme Court. There is a case called Liu, which has has certain. Uh, petition pending. That is a case that wants to uh, challenge the Court of Appeals decision called speechnow.org versus FEC, which is actually the case that created super PACs, not Citizens United. Uh, Lou would overturn that or wants to see it overturned, but every Court of Appeals that has considered it has has ruled along the same lines as saying those super PACs are allowed. I don't see the court having any appetite to take that case. Beyond that, at some point, the court is going to take, I think, a disclosure case, but, uh, but I don't see a vehicle coming forward right now. 
out. And I think the question for the court is going to be again, not really, you know, can you have disclosure? Yes, you definitely can have disclosure of campaign contributions. And we do. We have more disclosure than we've ever had in the history of our country. The question is going to be how far out can you extend it? Again, to, to groups that are not saying vote for this candidate, vote against that candidate, but to groups that are talking about public issues and public affairs. Uh, and, and that's going to be where the battle is, I think. But I don't see the vehicle you, on the horizon. You say talking about public issues and public affairs, but I mean, you know, these ads, if you were to read the transcript, it might say one thing, but when you watch the ad, certainly if it's a TV ad with the with the ominous music in the background and the and the and the uh person that they have doing the voiceover uh and the black and white images of the of the office holder soon to be candidate but not yet quite in the candidate perspective still technically the office holder perspective and 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 telling everybody at the end ask them why they they have this position that's that's um I mean, I think I think the public pretty well understands that as 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 not really about the issue, but uh, um, more a judgment about the candidate uh, to be on this. Right, right. It's the ad that says uh, Senator Daniel Soto or Daniel Ivy Soto has been seen stealing Social Security checks out of mailboxes. He kicks small dogs and hates children. Call him and tell him we don't need his agenda in the Capitol, right? And yeah, you know that's. I, look, those ads basically are disclosed now under election and communications provisions. It's been a long time since those ads were not disclosed, at least if they're run close to an election. Again, what we're seeing more and more is an effort to push out further and further and to get donors who didn't give for those types of ads, donors who gave for some other purpose. There's lots of reasons why organizations exist. I, I doubt that if we ask our listeners, do you agree with absolutely everything that every organization you're a member of does, most would say no. And we'd say, well, would you want to then thus be associated with that? And I think most would say no. Damn the civic courage and all that kind of stuff people want to say we got to have. They're going to say, no, it's not even fair to me to associate me with any specific action that the organization might do. So, you know, you've, you've raised a, a, an issue that, that right is a problem. I would note only that it was also recognized by the Supreme Court in Buckley v. Vallejo when it struck down limits on spending and, and cabined off disclosure requirements. Uh, the court said, look, the, the advocacy of election uh, you know, candidates blends into the advocacy of issues. A lot of the times there's simply no difference. And it's not like state legislatures, I mean, some state legislatures do, but it's not like all state legislatures don't meet in the run-up to elections. And it certainly isn't like Congress is not meeting in the run-up to the elections. And people will try to want to talk about issues. And, and moreover, those issues are often most salient for voters when the election is coming. So, um, you know, again, it becomes just a question of the trade-offs that we want to make. And these were not unknown to the Supreme Court uh, back in the days of Buckley v. Vallejo when it cabined off what you can do in terms of disclosure. And, 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 and as I pivot over to Danielle to, to comment on this issue as well, um, since this is being recorded, let me just simply say my name is Daniel Ivisoto. I did not approve that message, and uh, I don't believe that the uh, the voiceover provided by Mr. Smith is intended for an actual ad uh, against me. Uh, uh, Danielle, go ahead. Sure. Um, so I guess going back to the initial question, um, I don't really see anything particularly on the horizon for the Supreme Court. Um, obviously, that might change. Uh, Obviously, depending on how this election goes, if the Democrats end up winning the House, um, Senate, and presidency, you will probably see another HR1 um, similarly situated, and I'm sure there will be a whole lot of um, litigation based on that, and I'm sure a few of those questions would end up in front of the Supreme Court, but in the current immediate future, um, there's really nothing in particular for me. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. And so we are uh, running towards the end of the time that we have for this webinar. Um, and so uh, let me give each of you an opportunity to kind of uh, sum, th sum things up or, or touch on some issues that maybe uh, we uh, could have or should have touched on during this time up until now. And um, and so, uh, you know, about uh, three, three to four minutes uh, uh, a piece. And uh, Danielle, let me go ahead and start with you. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you all. This was a great discussion, um, and I was glad to be a part of it. Uh, I think 
at the end, what I will say is the states may feel a little bit harangued by Citizens United and what they could do. I think um, given the Supreme Court's you know, repetitive endorsement and support for transparency, that's certainly something that states can continue banging the drum on, um, kind of determining what works best for them um, as far as disclosure levels or what have you, but, um, or I guess, you know, money levels for disclosure triggering disclosure. But um, I, I think there's certainly a lot they can do there. And I think the states have really been kind of picking up that torch in the face of the federal government kind of leaving that out there. I do think more needs to be done, certainly on the federal level. And um, yeah, thank you again. Outstanding. Brad? Well, thank you, Senator, and thank you, Danielle, and thank you, NCSL. And Senator, I'm, I'm glad you liked my ad. I was hoping you'd, you'd, you'd appreciate that. You probably have had it. <laughs> not just similar. Um, I want to first wrap up one one loose end uh, that I didn't comment on. Danielle made a point about targeted advertising, and that has been, I've seen, a concern for many people. And the concern, of course, is that not everybody's seeing the same information. So certain things don't, in fact, get debunked, and you can kind of play you know, misleading ads to an audience likely to believe them, and, and those who would debunk them don't appear. Uh, and I think that's a, a concern that people have. I just point out, too, though, that targeting is something that is very effective for smaller grassroots campaigns. It allows them, it allows you to run a much more efficient, low-cost campaign. And when we complain about the amount of money spent and so on, we, we need, again, to consider those kinds of trade-offs. Just generally, then, to close, I, I would just note, and I'll focus on the, the dark money that's dominated much of our discussion today, is that you know we think when, when legislators are just considering disclosure legislation, uh, that legislation should incorporate reasonable monetary thresholds at which re registration or rec reporting is required. And I mean, people should really think about it, not just look at a number, oh, $500, we used to have 10 or something, but really do we need to know those $500 contributions? What's the benefit? What's the cost? Second, they should in incorporate some kind of major purpose test to determine who has reporting requirements. Uh, Danielle raised a little bit, you know, what that should be. It's ill-defined both federally and at the state level, uh, but it is something that seems to be required by uh, the Supreme Court as, as a matter of constitutional law, and that should be there so it's clear, and it obviously can't go too low, although it you know, may not need to be, may not need to be under anything under 50%. Third is I think we need to be careful about requiring unnecessary or immaterial information about donors. You know, do we need to require, especially for the people at the lower end, for example, disclosure thresholds, do we need to require their work information? So, because now people, you know, they try to get folks fired for giving to the wrong campaign and so on. Uh, and that's a, a serious type of thing. So we should look carefully. Do we need to require home addresses and, and, and that sort of thing? Or should we just publish a city, uh, something like that? And then we need to allow groups reasonable time to file reports. Uh, this idea sometimes that reports can be filed instantly on the Internet, I think, is carried away. It's, it's again, very hard, especially for grassroots groups and smaller organizations to comply with that. But even for larger organizations, it costs a lot of compliance costs, again, raises the cost of campaigning. So those are just a few of the warning things that I, I would put out there. And generally, I would say, I hope as legislators approach this issue, they do it with that sense of, of, of perspective, uh, you know, how big a problem is this really? We hear lots of hollering, but when you when you get down to saying, well, it's about 2%, and that's even including those LLCs that give to super PACs, uh, it doesn't maybe look like it's a problem that, re that requires dramatic action as opposed to perhaps a little gentle tweaking of our current laws. Thank you again. Okay, thank you very much. And so today, uh, once again, we had uh, Danielle Caputo with Issue 1, uh, joining us, as well as uh, Brad Smith from the Institute for Free Speech. I want to thank both of you for uh, for what I think it was a, a good discussion. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been difficult not being able to get together for conferences, which NCSL does so well. But, uh, but I do think that uh, today's, today's discussion has been a fruitful one, and I appreciate both of you uh, for having uh, joined us uh, today for this. Uh, let me go back to uh, Christy Samaripa uh, with the staff of the Elections Redistricting uh, section of uh, NCSL to uh, go ahead and close out and let us know a few other things that may be coming up in the near future. Great. Well, thank you, Senator. Um, I want to quickly uh, make note of a few upcoming NCSL events. 
Um, first, next week, there will be a Lessons Learned from the 2020 Primaries Zoom event on September 9th. We will discuss the timings of the timing of primaries, whether state and presidential primaries are best run jointly or as two separate events, how ranked choice voting performed this year, uh, and much more. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is NCSL's Base Camp, which is a three-day event. It will be held in a few weeks. Uh, this will be a unique online event where national thought leaders and policy experts join with states to map the way forward and to provide opportunities to engage with experts, ask questions, and walk away with new ideas covering state policy. Finally, I want to talk about um, a Zoom event that we will have on the latest 2020 census updates, which will be held on September 18th. The census has been in the news lately uh, with announced rollbacks of field operations and other items. Uh, we will take an opportunity to discuss what the latest updates mean for states. Now, we have come to the end of our time, and I am going to switch the screens. And if you do have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to those of us listed on the screen and contact us. Um, I want to thank you for spending time with us today. Please stay on the line for a quick survey. But most of all, I want to give a big thank you to Senator Ivy Soto, Danielle, and Brad. This has been a wonderful hour. And to all, please stay in touch and reach out if you have any questions. Thank you again. I hope you have a great day. Take care.